So before I start this very important and timely conversation on globalization and technology, let me take uh, the opportunity to thank especially the parents of our students, because every single graduation ultimately is an achievement for the student, but is also a, an incredible achievement for the family and for the parents who have made so many sacrifices to get you here. And so, you know, we don't have the privilege to interact with you parents uh, often and regularly, but for us, you know, when we interact with, with the students, with your son and daughters, it is a great, a great privilege, I have to say, and uh, we never forget the sacrifices you're making. So thank you so much. And thank you especially for committing to giving them an international uh, education. Uh, I work on nuclear weapons and technology, and uh, I say often to my students, we need more of you in this field. We need more diplomats, we need more negotiators, we need more uh, cosmopolitan thinkers. And the Fletcher does this better than any other school. And so I am really, really grateful that you have invested uh, you know, these resources to get your, your children to this school. So we want to open the discussion today, globalization in, in technology, and I really wanted to frame it a little bit as a contradiction. So it is very clear we are living in interesting, but also you know, uh, challenging times. Uh, every single country around the world that aspires to maintain or to achieve global status says he needs to win the technological race at all cost. And yet most of the technologies we compete on today, the semiconductors, you know, artificial intelligence, cyber, space, are all technologies that were actually created because of globalization. Because at some point we believe that global trade, a, you know, a world without borders somehow could really foster innovation. And so we are really at the cusp a little bit of a contradiction where we want to compete on technology, but those technologies actually were born out, in fact, of a lot of international cooperation and openness. So how do we solve this contradiction? In addition, societies have also come to term with both the positivity and negativity of technologies. Not one day goes by without reading something on artificial intelligence these days, right? So we have actually come to grasp not only the acceleration, the depth and, and pace of technological innovation, but also the incredible negative consequences, especially if these technologies go unregulated. And so this adds in another layer, I think, of, pro of problems and challenge to you know, contemporary international landscape. So what we want to do today is try to understand why are we now turning almost against globalization when ultimately it was globalization that gave us these technological spins. And we also want to understand what does it actually mean decoupling or de-risking the US economy from China? Is it even possible? And finally, we would like to understand how the cyber domain plays into the international competition today. What can we do about it? And if there is a little bit of time at the end, I'll talk a second about particularly nuclear technology and the nuclear energy market and how the nuclear energy market is now being affected by the Ukraine war. Let's all remember that we are not only dealing with a anti-globalization movement, we are also meeting in a moment where tensions run incredibly high, both in the European theater and the Asia Pacific theater. So there are a lot of challenges ahead of us. Let me turn to Professor Dan Dresner, who certainly does not need any introduction. Dan has been an incredible prolific uh, scholar. He has uh, a, a fantastic resume, which I'm not going to read, but I think what I want to say about Dan is that he has been able to attract also generalists to international security and international relations. He writes in a very accessible way. And to me, that is a great trait of a scholar, a practitioner, as also somebody that is a real public thinker. Then over to you for your opening remarks. How did you like this presentation? I mean, it's amazing. Please give a round of applause to Dan Dresden. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francesca. I'll take my wallet out later to, you know, <laughs> to pay things off. Um, there are experts to the left of me that are far better uh, versed in the actual technology uh, our, uh, competition that we're going to be talking about. So I, what I'm going to do is step back for a second and try to explain ideationally how we got here. That if we were having this panel 10 years ago, we'd be talking about the dominance of neoliberalism as an economic paradigm, 
uh, the idea that you know globalization under the rubric of the Washington Consensus, despite the 2008 financial crisis, was creating a rising tide that lifted all boats. And we are now in a world where it does seem like Every state is obsessed with, you know, some form of indigenous innovation of one kind or another. And the belief that in terms of developing new technologies, it doesn't matter if you win, you know, by an inch or by a mile, winning is everything. And this is a real problem. So I think there are basically sort of three shocks that sort of hit the system that caused a sort of slow evolution to, uh, to where we are today. Um, the first is the 2008 financial crisis in combination with what is commonly referred to as the China shock. So the idea was that China's entrance into the global economy and, you know, formally in the form of WTO admission would, you know, be a windfall, not just for China, but for everyone. Um, and what it became increasingly clear, most prominently in the 2016 paper that David Otter uh, and two of his co-authors uh, revealed is that in fact, there were places in the United States that were hit by technological, you know, by competition from China, and those places never really recovered, that it wasn't a win-win, that in the places where manufacturing left the United States um, due to uh, globalization, you know, wages were permanently depressed. People stayed unemployed for a longer time. The market didn't clear, as it were. Um, and so I think this was sort of, sort of first, like, in some ways, the first shock in terms of people's faith in market economics to actually lead things to work. And it caused people to believe, in, you know, on both parties, and this in some ways sort of explains the sort of populist movements you saw in both the left and the right, to believe that maybe those people who were advocating free trade didn't necessarily have America's best interest in heart, and maybe there needed to be some sort of restrictions put in place to prevent that from happening. The second shock was the pandemic. Um, and the reason this was a shock was because immediately afterwards, there was a lot of talk about how, you know, China was suddenly hoarding PPE. We suddenly, you know, the term global supply chain suddenly entered, you know, everyone's lexicon. And the belief that what the pandemic revealed was, is that if you globally source, um, you know, key aspects of your manufacturing process, you are going to be hostage to shocks that happen in those countries, and therefore your own supply chain will be affected. And, you know, you saw this in, in the form of concerns, you know, about, let's say, the price of automobiles, which suddenly skyrocketed. And the reason they skyrocketed was because all the semiconductors that were originally dedicated to car manufacturing got repurposed to uh, video game consoles because everyone was staying inside uh, during the pandemic. And then suddenly, when everyone wanted to get cars, they were fantastically more expensive. Um, and so the belief here was that you needed localized supply chains rather than global supply chains. The third sort of shock was this uh, a paper that two of my, my best friends uh, in the field co-authored by Henry Farrell and Abe Newman about weaponized interdependence. And the argument here was that if you think of the global economy as a network structure, any country that captures a key node in that structure can both uh, gain fantastic amounts of intelligence and also potentially use that control over that node as a form of coercion against other actors. So the most prominent example of this is the United States, which has taken advantage particularly of its centrality in global financial networks to be able to apply financial pressure on countries ranging from Iran you know, to, uh, to Russia, and also uh, in terms of the export controls against China, try to uh, extend or at least delay China's ability to play catch up technologically. Um, and all of this is fed into, I think, within the Biden administration, what someone referred to as the post-neoliberal set of ideologies, the idea that in fact, we don't, you know, the reliance on the free market is, is misplaced, that we actually need to revive industrial policy. And indeed, you can argue with a combination of the bilateral, or sorry, the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, law, the uh, CHIPS Act, and then the Inflation Reduction Act, the sort of greatest uh, investment in the form of industrial policy that we've seen in perhaps 50 years. All of this is leading to this sort of, you know, belief that no longer do we need or should we rely on the global economy. We have to develop things indigenously. And if we do that and we can extend our lead, the U.S. can also maintain its agenda. All right, let me explain why all that is wrong, because um, I'm not kidding about this. Um, these are, and I, I want to be, this is going to sound patronizing, but I don't mean it to. I think the people who have developed these ideas are well-meaning. I think they genuinely believe these things. 
I have severe doubts about whether all of these things are correct. First of all, with respect to the China shock, that's absolutely true. But what the authors of that paper also, also acknowledge is that in terms of welfare gains, the United States was made better off by you know, opening trade with China. Where the United States failed was in compensating the losers of that from the winners. That's not a failure of technology policy. That's not a failure of industrial policy. That's a failure of social safety nets. That's a political failure. In terms of the pandemic, the idea that global supply chains were somehow more fragile than national supply chains is wildly wrong. As it turned out, it was supply chains that were highly localized that were far more vulnerable. Indeed, global supply chains, although you think they would be more vulnerable, precisely because they were so globalized, most of the actors involved in those global supply chains were well aware of that and actually took steps to make sure that if there was a shock, they had you know, contingencies. So I don't want to say that everything worked perfectly during the pandemic, but generally speaking, the global supply chains proved to be far more robust than was generally expected to be at the time. And then with respect to weaponized interdependence, um, the way I would put this is, is that there is no denying that, that the discovery of weaponized interdependence and the enthusiasm with both the United States and other actors have embraced this has caused a lot more examples of economic coercion and very little in the way of actual concessions. In other words, what we're seeing is a lot more sanctioning activity and not much in the way of any concessions. Um, so I would describe that as sort of a net, gain, uh, net loss. Nonetheless, these ideas that we're seeing, these sort of post-neoliberal ideas, I think are really taking hold. It's going to take some time for them to play out to see whether or not they become the new normal or whether you see a reversion back to a more neoliberal uh, worldview. I tend to think they're going to become the new normal because even if they don't work economically, they work really well politically. Because we are in a world now where China is not viewed in the same way as it was a decade ago. You can tell that from the polling. Um, we're in a world where Russia is not viewed the same way as they were a decade ago. Um, and in a world of great power competition, you can justify an awful lot of industrial policy and economic restrictions in the name of national security, even if those aren't necessarily actually what's going on. And if you doubt me, go Google later the federal wool and mohair program. And you know your, your parents and grandparents can tell you about it. And I will just close quickly on this point. It, I, it, Francesca mentioned the term de-risking, and this is a term that uh, Jake Sullivan and Janet Yellen recently talked about in terms of their approach to China. And it, what's interesting about this, I think, is that honestly, it seems like the Biden administration for the first time is trying to seek a floor in terms of just how much decoupling is supposed to take place. And so the idea is that they don't want decoupling. They just want something called de-risking, which sounds great. Um, and it... I am encouraged that they actually recognize that the rhetoric is getting a little overheated. But as someone who studies sanctions, let me assure you that the term de-risking doesn't mean what they think it means. What de-risking means is that if there is any sort of sanction that takes place, there is an expectation that corporations will overreact to it and actually engage in cutoffs of economic exchange due to an abundance of caution. And so my concern in terms of this sort of technological arms race is not that the U.S. is going to fall behind. My concern is that much like the most aggressive forms of chemotherapy, we will kill very healthy parts of the economy in order ostensibly to save ourselves. And I'll close on that point. Oh, terrific. All right, let me build on this by um, asking um, Adam Siegel to comment on this uh, decoupling or de-risking from China. Adam is an alumni of uh, uh, the Fletcher School class 1993 currently Special Advisor of the State Department Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy. He has been for many years really one of the leading voices on cybersecurity at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's very, very well known in the U.S. and overseas for his work also on China. I wanted to ask you, Adam, if you, you know, we talk often about this great powers competition, right? Could you give us a sense of this competition in the cyber realm? And if you could add also your views about whether decoupling with China makes any sense at all, um, and, and if so, in what parts? Uh, thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, and uh, so I've been in the State Department for five weeks. This is the first time they've let me out. So uh, I have to remember to say that anything I say is my own personal opinion. Uh, I'm not representing the US government or the State Department. Uh, so that said, uh, very nice to be back uh, at Fletcher. I think this is the first time I've been in this room for 30 years, although I was back at a conference uh, maybe before the pandemic. Um, 
so uh, one of the things I've already learned at the State Department is to answer the question you want to answer, not the one that's uh, <laughs> uh, asked. Uh, but I will, I think, get to those. Um, I think actually Dan um, set us up nicely for the pivot to cyber because I would add a fourth reason for the uh, breakdown of the consensus. Um, and you can tell me why it's wrong, but I think uh, the Snowden disclosures uh, played a huge part and that maybe is a, a bullet point under weaponized interdependence. But I think the Snowden disclosures, the rest of the world woke up and said, oh, we're all operating on American technology. We, we maybe had some concerns about it. I mean, I when I used to go to China in the mid or early 2010s, uh, my uh, interlocutors would say, you know, we know that Cisco turns over data to the US government that I'd always say, no, no, that's not true. We don't do that. Uh, it turns out it was a little bit true um, under certain legal conditions and some extra legal conditions. But I think a uh, lot of the world woke up and said, oh, there are some real security costs, autonomy costs to being reliant on American technology and start to think about how they can control the, the, where the data is stored, who has access to it and, and, uh, and everything else. I think what we're seeing um, uh, in this space is uh, the great powers in particular are jockeying for advantage in cyber, but nobody really knows what that means, right? We don't really know uh, what cyber is actually useful for yet. Uh, I think we are still in an ongoing debate. Um, we uh, have been trying to have discussions about some of the rules of the road, right? We're called the, the norms of behavior that have happened at the UN. Uh, through first the, the group of government experts and now the open-ended working group. Uh, and I think we're clearly at an inflection point, right? The, the Russians are not really paying attention to the norms that we all agreed upon, all uh, the UNGA agreed upon. They're spending plenty of time on critical infrastructure, even though they said they would respect that norm. Uh, and so what comes next, I think, is a real, is a real uh, question, right? Is it, is it useful to continue to have these discussions on what responsible behavior is? Are we gonna to shift to something that looks more like accountability? Do we actually start punishing people for breaking what like-minded countries say the rules are? Uh, or are we just gonna continue uh, jockeying in this space? Second, I think um, what we're clearly seeing is the importance of um, non-state actors, right? That's always been one of the characteristics of this, what we think is gonna be important about cyberspace. Um, again, it, it's not the 400 uh, pound hacker in his mother's basement that we're seeing. I mean, there are lots of individual hackers in the IT army that's been involved in Ukraine, but that really hasn't played a significant role in the conflict. But the tech firms have clearly played a significant role uh, in defending Ukraine. Um, and uh, it, it is clear that countries are gonna ask more of those firms uh, as we move forward to deliver uh, particularly on security and, and defense. Um, and I think the firms are, you know, the, Ukraine was a, a fairly easy case to say that they would help out. Uh, other cases might be uh, more, more difficult. Third, as I uh, kind of alluded to, what is cyber good for? What are cyber attacks good for? You know, I think here the debate is still quite open and I uh, look forward to Josephine's uh, um, input on this. I, you know, there was, I think, a lot of expectation right before the war started that we were going to see destructive, widespread disruptive and disruptive attacks from Russia on Ukrainian infrastructure and perhaps on NATO and its allies. We did not see that. We did see a you know, disruptive attack on Viasat, which did have some uh, impact. But really what we've seen since then is mostly uh, pretty widespread. It's not that they're not doing it. They're doing it fairly uh, at a pretty high cadence, but it's mostly annoyance, disruption, some wipers, uh, espionage, and, and other things we're seeing there. And so the question is, well, did the Russians screw up? That might be the case, right? They thought the war was going to end quickly. They didn't want to take out critical infrastructure. Are they not organized for this, right? The, the Russian forces, the, the GRU and the FSB seem to think of cyber more as a kind of information cognitive warfare tool as opposed to one that creates uh, kinetic or other uh, physical outcomes. Was the defense really good? Which may be the case, right? Ukraine has been fighting uh, cyber defense since 2014 and they were preparing and they had the US 
uh, government and US tech firms that all in place there. So I think there's a real question now about one of our widespread assumptions is the offense always has the, has the advantage that maybe uh, uh, the defense actually, if it has time, can prepare pretty well for, for uh, lots of attacks. Um, and then finally, I'll just conclude with what comes next. And clearly we're all looking at Taiwan next, right? Um, what are the Chinese learning from this uh, situation? Uh, and I think they're learning a lot. I think they're learning not to make the same mistakes that the Russians made. Um, and the organization of, of Chinese forces, the, the strategic support forces talk a lot more about integrated attacks um, and um, what they would want to do to disrupt both um, Taiwanese and possibly Japanese, US, Philippine, other infrastructure. Uh, so they're very unlikely to have the same thing again if unfortunately we were to have a conflict across the Straits. So I'll stop there. Wonderful, thank you very much, Adam. And we will have a, the Q&A at some point and so you will have the chance to ask um, more, more questions, of course. Um, I want to turn to Josephine, who is a beloved associate professor of cybersecurity and policy here at the Fletcher School. And I think Josephine really brought, uh, in a way, Fletcher School to the 21st century with her classes on artificial intelligence and cyber. And I think what she did was also making uh, people like me, political scientists, uh, understand a little bit of the technology, right? And there is something really important about understanding the technology if you want to be a policy. Uh, you know, policymaker or a regulator. You can't regulate something you don't understand how it works. And she brought, in my view, this ability and, and really the, the accessibility of knowledge that it's, it's so, and that's why your class are so popular. Um, I also want to mention that uh, Josephine just finished a, her second book, which is called the Cyber Insurance Policy Rethinking Risk in an Age of Ransomware, Computer Fraud, Data Breaches, and Cyber Attacks. And to you, Josephine, I wanted to ask a little bit what I would call as the war on data, right? What would you say are some of the, the best practices you have seen around the world among countries to protect their data or to defend themselves in cyber attacks, which we talk about all the time? So I like, I like the framing of that as the war on data because it suggests <laughs> that either we win or the data does. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of some of the ways that countries have approached this, and then I'm going to circle back to the question of what are the best practices, because one of the things we do in cybersecurity is we just sort of assert we think these are the best practices, and then it turns out 10 years later that like actually we shouldn't have been making you change all your passwords every 90 days, and that was incredibly counterproductive. Um, so I don't know the answer to what are the best ways to protect data and networks. I wish I did, but we do have now a variety of different ways that different governments are trying to do that, and ideally 10 years from now, we'll learn that we've all been doing it very wrong and have some better ideas. I think one of the things that's interesting about that, which speaks a little bit to what Adam and Dan were both talking about, is the ways that we've seen the United States shift its own thinking on that to begin with. So when I was in graduate school, if you go back 10, 15 years, a lot of the sort of US government rhetoric around cybersecurity and data protection was really focused on the idea of what we sometimes call the open internet, um, which means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but mostly means, I think, um, you, you're both welcome to disagree with me on this as everybody in the room, that we don't restrict the ways that packets flow across the network. So if you think about sort of you've got a global network, you have all of these different autonomous systems interconnecting, they're all passing packets using the same protocols like the internet protocol, then one of the things we often associate with the idea of an open internet is that those packets can move freely across all of those autonomous systems without a lot of filtering or throttling or, or other kinds of blocking. And in many cases, this was something that the US used or scholars in the US used to criticize the Chinese approach to the internet where there's a lot more restriction of what kinds of packets are allowed into the country, what kinds of packets are allowed out of the country. There's a lot of very deliberate architecture that's gone into building the internet in China to make that easier to do at a variety of different levels. And that was something that the United States and many other countries, right, especially in Western Europe, the other countries that usually side with the US on tech policy issues, felt was kind of against not just the philosophical idea of the internet, but also the technical architecture. It's set up to be 
a network that does not discriminate between different kinds of packets, that treats all kinds of media and information in the same way, packages it in the same way. And I think if you look at sort of the political landscape today, there's there's been a real shift there, right? You're seeing the United States government talk very seriously about banning cert certain types of services and applications. You're seeing a lot of approaches to thinking about data protection that look very close to what we usually call data localization. Right, this idea of we don't want U.S. persons' data stored in China. We don't think that's a, that there's any way to protect certain kinds of data overseas. And again, this is something for a long time we've been criticizing China for, saying, why are you blocking all of these services? Why are you requiring companies to host Chinese data in China? That kind of undermines a lot of the efficiency, a lot of the, the benefits that we associate with cloud computing, being able to move data around the world kind of freely wherever there's extra capacity or cheap energy or things like that. So I think that shift has been a really interesting one and one that kind of changes the question of what do we think are the best practices? Because I think the answer 10 years ago would have been, we think the best practices are to largely trust the big cloud companies with your data, to trust that they have the most skilled, most experienced, uh, most threat intelligence sort of all of the expertise you would need to protect that data, to detect when somebody's attacking it, and to copy it in multiple different places if there are going to be um, attacks on its availability, attempts to delete or wipe it. And now we're seeing that sort of shift a little bit, not totally away from cloud computing, of course, but in the direction of we think actually a lot of the security of our data is really pretty closely linked to where it is physically, where those servers are. Um, there are certainly differences between the way that the United States is thinking about that and the way China is thinking about that. But we're seeing it around the world in a lot of different forms come back to questions of sort of different flavors of data localization. We're seeing that in the discussions in India around what their data protection legislation is going to look like, which have gone through a lot of different iterations and are certainly not finalized yet, but is something that is, is very much on their minds. We're seeing it a little bit in Brazil now where the government is also sort of trying to wrap its head around where it's comfortable having its own data, where it's comfortable having citizens' data. And it's a very hard thing to impose on a network that's not designed for it to say, you know, we're going to restructure things so that people's data is really linked to their geography. It's something we've been doing for a while. And so there, there are definitely opportunities for that, but it does require kind of reimagining what the architecture of the internet is gonna look like. The other thing I wanna talk about a little bit is this defense against cyber attacks. So thinking about data localization, I would say is partly an attempt to protect against data breaches. It's partly an attempt to make government access to that data easier. Right, if it's stored within your own boundaries, then generally most governments feel they, they have the tools they need to, whether legal tools, technical tools, whatever else, to get access to that data when they want it. In terms of protection against cyber attacks, I think the most hopeful spin on what Adam was talking about with sort of the full breakdown of the GGE and the OEWG and the UN is that a lot of governments understand better now than they did five, 10 years ago that they should not be waiting for norms to help them protect against attacks on critical infrastructure. And I don't know that any governments ever thought they were gonna do that to the exclusion of actual technical defenses, but I think many more of them understand now the urgency of protecting their own critical infrastructure and doing that sort of from the, the technology standpoint, even if all of the political and diplomatic discussions are breaking down, and especially if all of those discussions are breaking down. The bad news is there are still no very reliable ways to do that because critical infrastructure uses a whole bunch of different legacy systems, requires an enormous amount of coordination with the private sector, with usually a lot of different private sector entities. Um, I do think that we've seen some progress. I, I think, and we can argue about this, that some of the signs in Ukraine are hopeful around protection of critical infrastructure, that the difference between the kinds of protections that were in place in 2015 and 2016, when Russia was able to take parts of Ukraine's electric grid completely offline and where they are now is pretty significant. Um, and there's a lot of you know, help and assistance that's gone into that, not just the Ukrainian government, um, but, but it suggests for instance, that we've made fairly significant improvements in learning how to segment critical infrastructure networks. So that's what happens when you sort of say, as soon as we see a malware infection on one server or one machine, we wanna be able to quarantine that, isolate it from the rest of the network before it can spread to the entire electric grid or, or whatever the network is doing. I think that has gotten much, much better 
than it used to be. I think our detection skills are improving. Um, some of that is sort of thanks to AI. Some of that has to do with kind of how easily software is now able to look at threat signatures from previously detected programs and find ones that are not exactly the same, right? Not, not the sort of antivirus protection of 15 years ago, but varied a little bit in ways that are still recognizably similar. And I think we're seeing some progress there. And some of that is sort of less technical and more information sharing progress. The ability for different countries, different companies to say, hey, we are seeing this, we need, you know, we want you to be on the lookout for it and moving faster and having more mechanisms and more organizations that help do that. So those are some of the things that I think we think of as best practices now. There's a lot of, a lot of progress left to be made, but certainly I think some positive indicators on that front. Let me stop there. Wonderful. All right, before I open the floor, I wanted also to um, maybe share a couple of observations about my own field, which is really the nuclear, the nuclear field. Um, just uh, to disclose, I am part of a working group of uh, uh, put together by the Director General of uh, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, Rafael Grossi, to look at the situation of Japorizia in Ukraine. So we are looking at the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. We are looking at landmines uh, uh, on the floor of the uh, reactor um, area. We are looking at staff of in the nuclear power plants being tortured. Uh, some have been detained uh, in complete violation of international law. But beside that, there are serious concerns about the potential destruction of the reactor or a potential accident. It's not going to be the scale of Fukushima, but it, it could affect very well, you know, substantial areas of Ukraine and around. And so one of the questions I often uh, am asked uh, by policymakers in the US is, you know, can we do something about it? As in, can we apply sanctions against the Rosatom, which is really the hand of the Russian Federation when it comes to nuclear? And my answer is no, unless you completely want to sink your own nuclear industry. The nuclear industry and the nuclear domain to me is a perfect example of a very entangled and intertwined industry that was born out of the belief that the market would have always stayed open and free. Let me give you an example. We went out of business in the United States in building reactors because we suck at manufacturing, right? And we let the Russians dominate in the reactor construction. But we actually retained the domination over the service, for example, the maintenance or the policy. And policy means US driving nuclear safety and security guidelines domestically and internationally. We then let the South Korean, for example, take part of the production of, uh, uh, you know, reactor material. And then others, for example, like France took, for example, in charge of, uh, you know, transportation uh, techniques and technology. So the nuclear industry by nature is a global industry, right? Yes, the U.S. does not compete in building reactors, but we compete on other things, right? All of a sudden, I would say this actually started, and in fact, after 2008, all of a sudden we discovered something and we discovered that we were uncompetitive on the reactors construction. Nobody cared about this because the nuclear industry, because of the cost of construction, rely on a global supply chain, require multiple players. And since 2000, 2008, there has been a very clear and consistent push to actually nationalize the nuclear industry. So much so that at some point we started thinking about competing in the nuclear energy market as a question of national security. In fact, in 2016, the Department of Energy released the report saying that if we, if we lose the ground in the nuclear energy domain, we will lose ground in terms of national security, right? But what is the problem? The problem, of course, is that the nuclear industry is today incredibly entangled. And if, if for the United States really wanted to bring back the manufacturing capacities to build nuclear reactors, it would take us 10 to 15 years. And it's very unclear whether the cost would actually be competitive on the market, right? The Russians have it down to a science and by quite, quite um, uh, you know, by, by long margin, they actually are probably the cheapest on the market. 
So trying somehow to force a, you know, a decoupling of the supply chain would actually have an enormous impact on the nuclear industry domestically that you are actually trying to protect. Right? And so these forces somehow are really, are really pushing and pulling right, in, in various directions. The nuclear industry itself does not want sanctions on Rosatom, on Russia. And they told me explicitly, if we apply sanctions on Rosatom, the cost for us to produce fuel in the United States are going to sink to sank our own profits. We won't be able to do it. And I want to tell the story because it will come a point where we need to recognize that the, this age of technological competition has to be both competition and cooperation. That there will be nodes where we will have to cooperate. There will be nodes where we'll be dependent and nodes where we really can compete. But trying all of a sudden to reinvent the wheel and bring back manufacturing we've long gone I think are actually not very wise policies and strategies. And so we need to prepare, I think, the, the, the new thinkers, you know, the scholars and practitioners that go out there to say, we, we, need, we need to be comfortable with the idea that in some nodes of the supply chain, we will be dependent, right? We will not win this race. And in some, we intend to compete and we'll probably dominate. So that Cooperation and competition is, in my view, the most unique element of this age, and one, in my view, that would require very sophistication, a, a big, big deal of diplomacy, and a lot of dialogue and engagement. So let me finish with this, and I want to open the floor for any question you might have on any of the technology we discuss and anything else that you might be interested in. I've been asked to use the mic because we are going to record it. Thank you. So it's working? No. Keep talking, it might work. It is working? Okay. I'm not kidding, actually. Like, these things are often voice activated. Yeah, anyway. So <laughs> We're technology experts. That's Trust right. Us. I'm not a technology hey. expert. Oh, what did I tell you? Yeah. My name is Don Ross from Class of 66, which says I don't know anything about technology has evolved. So if you could explain to me what the negative impacts are of sharing this information, because I don't know what China is going to do if they know my TikTok date and what I'm using or what my address is or anything I have in the cloud except my credit cards maybe. I don't know how that's going to help anybody or why they do it. So there must be some negative things that you guys are all worried about that you can explain. Thank you. So I'm going to say what I think people are concerned about and then I want you to correct me. All right. In the sense of I think I know what policymakers are worried about. Um, and I think there's two things. The first is the possibility that U.S. citizens might um, be subject to blackmail. In other words, you know, think about the OPM hack uh, that was in some ways the sort of first major hack. The idea that, that um, if Chinese technology companies have access to what Americans are doing, you know, first it might allow them to identify who potentially is, is uh, someone that could be turned in terms of you know, providing information to China or someone who could be blackmailed. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but that's nonetheless one of the fears. The second fear is with respect to AI and big data, which is, again, as I understand this, one of the ways in which a lot of like, you know, the race for developing general AI revolves around is essentially how much data can be analyzed in order to get a sense of how, you know, humans across the board behave. And China, on the one hand, is sitting on the largest sorts of data. It's, you know, the second now most populous country in the world. But, you know, for a variety of reasons, you might want a more heterogeneous, heterogeneous source of data. And that's where potentially getting access to what Americans do, what others do actually create, in theory, better trained AI within China. Now, I'm not sure either of these things are actually true, but I, this is what I hear. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, that, I think that's right. The, the, on, on the, on the <laughs> right. first one, uh, you take the OMB hack plus the Anthem hack plus the Equifax hack plus the Marriott hack. You put them all together and you can map certain types of people that might be approachable or you may have a larger picture of what the U.S. population is doing um, that you could then turn into a counterintelligence or an intelligence uh, advantage. Uh, and then uh, Dan's second point on AI training is also right, I think, generally that the, the data that the Chinese are sitting on is Chinese consumer data, which is useful for predicting what Chinese consumers are going to do, but not for other things. And then I think there is a third concern about disinformation and misinformation. 
um, and ability to shape those messages um, so they are uh, more uh, resident with a US uh, audience. My name's Nate, class of 2008. It's so wonderful to be back. So I'll first give some info about myself and then a few questions. So I work as an in-house corporate researcher at a large global transportation company. So the topic of shifting supply chains is just incredibly relevant. Go back on Monday, we'll continue the discussion. So I guess my, my three questions, shall we say, are looking at nearshoring, like what do you see in 10 years as the evolution of some of these supply chains, right? Because there's the debate between the long, thin, narrow supply chains with airplanes coming in from around the world versus the shorter, thicker supply chains, you know, coming out of Mexico. So do you see A, nearshoring, is it real? B, what will this look like, you know, in 10 years? And C, if you are an industry, like how would you invest to win in this era of shifting supply chains in 10 years? So thank you. And thank you for helping me in my work uh, coming Monday. <laughs> That question was directed at me. Um, so I guess I would, you know, say the following: Is nearshoring real? Yes. I mean, you know, in the sense that I, I think I, the IMF just released a paper that included a fascinating chart showing the sort of mentions of the terms nearshoring or friendshoring or allyshoring in corporate presentations over the last five years. It's gone up by like a logarithmic rate. So obviously, it's it's happening uh, relatively quickly. And even in, in places where you see a lot of uh, corporations that have a lot of investments in China, you know, you're seeing in some ways decoupling by attrition where they're not reinvesting in what's going on in China. They're redirecting to places like India or Bangladesh or Mexico. And in some ways, you can argue that the way they're looking at this is that, you know, the thing that's most important in life is family. And, you know, the family of nations that you trust are the ones that you're going to want to keep your key nodes around. And that no longer includes China. Um, as to what this means 10 years from now, that is what I like to describe as a yacht question. And by that, I mean that if I knew the answer to that, I would not be speaking to you right now. I would be on my yacht somewhere. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, David Forsey. I didn't go to Fletcher. Thanks for being here. Big fan of all of you. Um, so there's a tendency in the public discourse to uh, focus very narrowly on IT-centric innovation, when you could argue that a lot of the key breakthroughs that will change our society are actually really basic science questions, quantum computing, room temperature superconducting, blah, blah, blah. And um, a couple of years ago, I was speaking to I don't know if it was the dean, but a professor at a leading computer science research university who said, we don't know what to do because a lot of our quantum computing experts are Chinese nationals. And, and we're certainly not racist, but we, we frankly don't know what to do. And how do academic institutions, what criteria do they use to decide when they start limiting the exchange of basic science research? How, how, do, how do they even think through that problem? because it just seems incredibly intractable. And as academics yourselves, well, anyway, you, you understand the point. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the US's perspective has always, for the most part, been, you know, uh, what is it, high fences, short yards, whatever, high fences. I thought it was, I thought <laughs> it was low fences, fences high hedges or something, I don't remember. Anyways, as few <laughs> technologies as possible, right? The, 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 the default has always been that basic should be open. Um, and then you uh, focus on applied and, and those that have dual use. But clearly we're entering, especially with quantum and synthetic biology and some of these other spaces that are, you know, they're not dual use, they're omni-use, right? So the, the questions become uh, much harder. Um, I think we um, certainly saw a swing that we're now correcting for with the China initiative um, and a number of uh, Chinese American or Chinese born uh, scientists feeling that they were under a um, undue uh, uh, circumspection uh, and it, this clearly had an effect on their work and the attraction of the United States as a uh, place for um, scientific uh, uh, discovery, which is our great strength, our great superpower. Um, I think there was, you know, clearly also some writing that needed to happen, right? A lot of universities, I 
was talking to universities in the 2010s about this risk with China and, and you know, scientists would always say, there's no risk, there's no risk at all. Like we're just, we're gonna be as open as possible. And I think people realize that that's not completely true, right? There is clearly uh, a risk uh, involved in there. Um, and I think we're seeing, you know, MIT, for example, two years ago, three years ago, issued a new report about how they were gonna deal with research openness um, that I think kind of set a new bar about how universities are gonna, uh, are gonna talk about it. I think, um, you know, consistently the, the argument that I made was that um, uh, it, it's really a very narrow counterintelligence problem. It should not be an immigration broad uh, exposure problem. Like we should figure out which technologies are most of concern to us. Um, you know, we should figure out who's coming and where they're coming from. And those specific individuals may be worth paying attention to, but broadly, the default should be uh, to as uh, greater, as much openness as possible. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm an LLM student graduating tomorrow. Now, uh, I think some very valid points have been raised here and uh, uh, we are looking at investment investments in US and IRA has really attracted a lot of people world over. But at the same time, trying to put up a photovoltaic uh, manufacturing plant here for panel, it's going to take almost 16 months. Whereas world over, it can be done in six months, which means, and the, when we talk to the government, we find that they are not very, uh, they are kind of resistant to any kind of changes. And in 16 months, the technology will become obsolete. That's how it happened with photovoltaic. And 90% of silicon cells are being manufactured by China. In the current kind of situation with the geopolitical situation and the climate issue, what do you suggest can be the way forward then? Thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, my name is Birendra, LLM23. Thank you. I have. Um... I'm going to, um, I've I spent a lot of time thinking about this in the, in the uh, case of semiconductors. You remember the TC, TMC uh, head, Morris said, you know, we transport this industry in the United States and semiconductors produced in the United States would cost 3000, you know, times more. They are, you know, we're going to slow down the economy. And uh, um, so I think, I think the question of, is it worth bringing the manufacturing back to the United States? Does the United States have the skills? Especially if this used to be a post-manufacturing economy, right? So what are the costs and benefits? My understanding, I, was, I just came back from Korea. Um, the, idea, the, the idea that seems really interesting to me is that if we are thinking about uh, competing at the global level at this point, right? And, and then you said this, like, it would be better to have trade with friends instead of like with China. I think the idea of, uh, and I know Sandra has, has, has uh, written a lot about this, this idea of technology alliances is a way for the United States to say, look, I might not be the perfect place where to put manufacturing, but perhaps Korea or Japan, they are now tied to me in a security alliance and economic alliance could actually be the node that I'm looking for, right? So diversification. But is it going to work? I, I think this, these are questions that need to be, to be asked. And in every single industry that I've looked at, the semiconductor and the nuclear in particular, bringing the manufacturer back to the United States will increase the cost of production. There's no doubt about this. So that will make it less competitive unless the government decides to embrace even more national industrial policies and more subsidies. But in the case of nuclear, this was not our history. The history of the nuclear industry in the United States has always been a market-based industry. We have never been US subsidies behind the nuclear, nuclear industry like Russia and China. So I think there are some strategic de de decisions that we will have to make on what technologies will require even more investments by the United States government. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Rafael. I'm a MOLD uh, 2023 graduate. Um, I had a question about um, the advent and specifically the misuse of uh, generative AI. Um, so we've seen a lot of um, talk about artificial intelligence in recent months. Um, Microsoft invent, uh, invested like $10 billion in ChatGPT. Google came out with their own AI. Um, and I, one of the things that stood out to me 
is the fact that a lot of these uh, corporations that are integrating AI into their uh, into their businesses are the 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 AI just doesn't do what they claim it does, and it is extremely flawed. Like for example, um, when Google launched their uh, AI chatbot, it said that a brand of a wireless vacuum cleaner had a cord that was 15 feet long. And so I'm just uh, wondering, um, what is the best way to counteract the misuse of AI? And what do you see as the most likely use of uh, artificial intelligence in the practice of foreign affairs and international relations? OK. <laughs> Um, so I, I think you're right that the generative AI programs we're seeing are not as good as they're perhaps being billed. And on the whole, I think that's good news in terms of worrying about misuse, because I think one of the ways you combat misuse of technologies is you have them not work very well. And then it's harder to misuse them just as it's harder to use them in, in legitimate circumstances. There is, I think, an enormous amount of concern right here at Fletcher. I've you know, been at faculty meetings where professors are worried or all our students are going to use ChatGPT to write every assignment we ever give them from here on out and all the way on up through much more serious concerns about could this be used to scale up targeted phishing attacks? Could this be used to deceive people at scale in ways that otherwise would have or previously would have required an enormous amount of time and investment and individual tailoring. Um, I don't know what the best way to combat that is as the technologies get better. I do think that there's this perception right now of AI was kind of developing very slowly, quarter mile at a time, and now it's all of a sudden zooming forward so fast that we have to really put the brakes on. That hasn't been my sense. My sense is it's still somewhat gradual. It's still full of bugs and that there's perhaps not as much of a need to like stop development on all AI because it's gotten so brilliant. I do think that there are safeguards. I do think we're seeing a lot of policymakers talk about stuff like human oversight of certain kinds of applications of AI. Um, what that looks like is going to depend a lot on the individual application, right? Whether it's just a person rubber stamping a machine decision or actually a person who has some understanding of how that decision was reached and what went into it. There's also a whole field of research on explainable AI, trying to, to get at that question of when uh, an algorithm makes a decision, how do we understand that? If it's something that requires so many data inputs and, and sort of so many layers of calculations that there's no kind of obvious human translation of what that looks like. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see some advances and some progress there. I also think it's going to be very application specific, though, right? I think it's hard to say, how are we going to combat the misuse of AI? I think you can think about how are we going to combat the misuse of AI in the classroom versus how are we going to combat the misuse of AI in autonomous vehicles versus how are we going to combat misuse of AI in weapon systems? And each of those is going to require a lot of understanding of what does misuse actually look like in that context and what kinds of security checks and protections can you put in place? I mean, we're, we're clearly at the throw it at the wall and see what sticks stage of this. I mean, if you look at the hearing that happened this week on, on AI regulation, uh, they floated the idea of, of transparency and allowing uh, researchers access to the data. Uh, they floated the idea of revoking section 230 for AI firms so that they become legally responsible for what happens. So then they, of course- When all else fails, always good to revoke 230. That. Uh, an FDA for data, so uh, an, an outside regulatory agency, so um, I, I, we're clearly at the beginning stages of, of, the, of these discussions. I just right. want to say, I, I do want to close or point out this delightful irony, which is, we, you know, political discourse in this country for the last few years has been, we need to focus on STEM. And God knows we don't need to focus as much on the humanities and the social sciences, because like, you know, really do people need to learn about, you know, things like DEI or what have you. And I do love the delicious irony that is now, you know, concerns about general AI are, are increasing. Yes, we obviously need the technological understanding of what's going on, but you know what? We really goddamn well need humanities also. And it would be nice if some of these people acknowledge that point. Sorry. All right, let me take the last three questions and then we are going to close, please. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Irina Chinde, I'm Fletcher 2008, and I'm afraid I have another yacht question for Dan and Francesca. So we talked um, about decoupling from China, but also cooperation and competition in certain areas. For instance, when we look um, at uh, manufacturing and uh, specific uh, technologies. What we noticed uh, recently is that um, some of, um, let's say, inputs, raw materials, uh, rare earth minerals that come from China also feed directly into the technological developments that take place into the United States, including, let's say, uh, when it comes to weapon systems that could potentially be used later down the road in a confrontation with, with China. Um, so in that, in that sort of circumstance, I'm kind of wondering, where does um, cooperation ends and we just have pure competition? And what are some of the implication when we look at the tensions related to Taiwan of this um, competition and cooperation between China and the United States um, in, yeah, in, into kind of supporting the, the US agenda, but also as a detriment of, of China? So where, where do things stand? What are some of the implications? Thank you. Please. Oh, Sandra. Hi, my name is Sandra. I am graduating tomorrow, so thank you so much for being here. I had a question in terms of the U.S. government. Sorry, rhetoric. I think you need to speak a little more closely. Oh, yes. than mine. U.S. government's rhetoric around decoupling with the PRC and how the U.S. should approach this as they're in intensifying their competition with the PRC and this decoupling rhetoric, but is pressuring also its allies to do this. And especially on, I think, across the U.S. embassies, um, they're, you know, say telling governments not to take the Huawei 5G bid or not to or asking foreign corporations to not use Huawei servers. But how do we actually do this when the US has no alternatives to give to those nation states or those corporations because we, we are now out of the manufacturing space and the cost or the alternatives, for example, like Nokia for 5G is just five times, 10 times more expensive than Huawei. So I just want to hear your thoughts and whether this is a sustainable policy that the US can continue that has already started. Thank you. Hi, Enrique Hidalgo, class of 98. And it's somewhat related. So you have given a lot of good reasons of why it may work or not, but the reality is we are embracing industrial policy. So the question is how deep is this going to change the economy? Is industrial policy here to stay? That's the first part of it. And the second, industrial policy has been done with the intent of competition. But we have three very different flavors of industrial policy. One is the European flavor, which is based on sticks and based on prescription. Another one is the American flavor, which is based on, on carrots and expanding markets and creating markets. To a certain extent, I'm, I'm generalizing. And the other one is a Chinese approach, which is more mercantilistic and dominating, dominating markets. Which one will win? Okay, let's go down the... Okay, uh, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> you don't have to do it all, dude. Okay, good. I'll, I'll answer the last one, I, I think. Um, is industrial policy here to stay? Yeah, I think it is. Unfortunately, the, the political economy of it is such that you're going to have firms increasingly dependent on the subsidies they're being offered in the IRA and other bills. And, you know, it's this feedback loop of because they're getting these subsidies, they're going to lobby for them to continue and will rail against them if they are removed. Furthermore, this is a rare area where, oddly, there's now bipartisan agreement on this because you've seen the Republican Party shift radically away from sort of uh, attachment to laissez-faire policies. They do industrial policy differently, but in, the concept is no longer alien on that side. And so I don't think if there's a change in government, there's necessarily going to be a change in, in that sort of policy. In terms of which one triumphs, I think that's how to put this gently. I think it's the wrong way to think about it, um, because my hunch is, frankly, none of these industrial policies are going to be critical enough to actually tip you know, the scales one way or the other. Um, I think some of these economies are going to do well. I think some of these economies won't. I don't think industrial policy is going to have a lot to do with it, to be honest. Um, there are rare instances in which investing in critical technologies at a critical moment can make a difference. I think, to be honest, in most of these cases, and in, furthermore, in most of these technologies, once they become generalized, 
it doesn't necessarily matter where they emerge first. Now, that's not true of everything, to be clear. Um, but I think in the end, the countries that wind up thriving aren't going to do so because necessarily of industrial policy. They're going to do well because of more general public goods investment and whether they're receptive to things like immigration and ideas. Okay, I'm going to take uh, Huawei. I think you're, no, is that what you want? You, sure. can, you, you should take it as well. Um, I think the sort of, the answer to the question of how is the U.S. doing it, my sense is primarily through threatening to withhold intelligence, saying if your networks are not secure, we're not going to be able to share classified information with you because we don't think you'll be able to protect it, which seems to have been fairly effective in terms of influencing several of its partners. The question of how sustainable it is, is a hard one. And I think the answer is, first of all, hardware lasts a while, right? So if you get everybody's 5G base stations on board with not being Huawei base stations, you buy yourself a few years before everybody's going to start replacing those. And that's not necessarily a long-term sustainable strategy. The question is, how sustainable is the Chinese tech industry? Um, and is it more sustainable than, than that strategy? Because I think very few of these Chinese tech firms that as you rightly point out are vastly undercutting their competitors on price are necessarily going to be able to keep that up in the long term. And anybody's guess whether or not that's something that can outlast sort of the US influence around whose base stations all of these other countries are buying. Um, I don't think it's impossible. That, that this could end up sort of having some fairly long-term influence on how far that Chinese infrastructure penetrates though? Uh, so actually, I, I don't think we're threatening that much anymore. We, we did certainly threat, threaten some countries with uh, about information sharing, but actually I, what, what I think is happening now is uh, we are um, trying to come to the table with money, right? So the CHIPS Act has $100 million for the next five years for, uh, the State Department uh, to help uh, put in uh, infrastructure there. We have the uh, the PGGI. I'm, I'm now have so many acronyms in my head because of reading all these documents in the last five weeks. The, uh, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure, uh, which is again also to help uh, in these specific situations. I think um, uh, we are arguing about long-term costs, right? So um, that yes, short-term, you're gonna get Huawei or ZTE 30% uh, less, but the long-term costs are gonna be higher uh, in particular because the uncertainty about Huawei and ZTE about their access to chips is, uh, is there. Uh, and then we're also arguing about uh, technological solutions. So in particular, Open RAN um, and trying to bring in uh, other suppliers uh, and arguing that actually that is good for the countries that are want to develop their own technology ecosystems because you can hopefully generate uh, software and your own hardware and other things uh, uh, in that space. Um, now, is that all going to be enough? Um, it's a good question, um, but I, I think it, it's a, a larger kind of strategy. Um, and, you know, look, lots of, for most of these countries, 5G is not the issue, 3G and 4G are, um, and they already, um, you know, they have a lot of Huawei and ZTE already in the stack. Um, so we have to address those realities. Wonderful. Great question about cooperation and competition. I will let maybe talk to you uh, uh, in the break. I have to close. I want to thank you so much for your attention and for being here today. And uh, if you want to mingle, we'll stay around for a little bit. But again, thank you so much. And congratulations to all the students who are graduating. <laughs>